Welcome to my first tutorial on shaders in Bevy. In this tutorial, we'll create the simplest possible material to get our own custom shader code running on an object in Bevy. We'll cover creating a mesh, creating a material strut, implementing the material trait on it, and then loading a custom shader. As well as showing exactly where you can find all this information on your own if you want to dig deeper into any part of it. We are going to follow the shader material example from the official examples, but we're going to simplify it by removing the color from the material. We will add this back in the next episode when we cover uniforms and bind groups in detail. If you are looking to learn more after this video, I would recommend the Bevy 0.6 blog post which describes the rendering system at a high level, and the Learn WGPU tutorial which will cover a lot of the vocab and theory of the graphics API. Let's get started with the code. As always, I'm going to start with my template project which you can find linked in the description, and you can clone it using Cargo Generate. This sets up a basic window, a normalized 2D camera, and the eGUI inspector on a toggle. Then, let's create a startup system to spawn a quad with our material. For now, we only need commands here. The bundle we want to spawn is the Material Mesh 2D bundle. I'm targeting 2D for this video, but the exact same techniques will work for 3D, and 3D is even simpler in some places. The two things we need for this bundle are a mesh and a material. We'll leave the transforms and visibility as the default. First, let's create a mesh. We need a mesh 2D handle, which is just a wrapper over a handle to a mesh. Because we're using handles, we need to use the asset management system. In our system, let's get the resource of assets of the mesh type, and then we can get a handle by calling meshassets.add and giving it the mesh. To get a mesh, we can use mesh from and give it any of the built-in shapes. We're just doing a basic 2D shape, so let's use a quad here. Now we need to call into to wrap the handle into a mesh 2D handle. Next we need a material, which is a handle to something of type M, where M is a specialized material 2D. If we look at this trait, we'll see an overwhelming amount of things that we'll need to learn and implement. But thankfully, if we read the description here and notice the last sentence, we'll see that there's a simpler trait called material 2D that we can use instead. Once again, as for everything in this video, there's a one-for-one -one counterpart with 3D materials. Now if we look at implementing Material 2D, we'll see a still overwhelming but simpler trait that we need to implement. Here there are only two functions that we absolutely need to implement for the code to compile, and we also need to implement Asset and Render Asset. To implement Render Asset, we only need to create two functions, but we also need three associated types that we'll need to figure out and set. Finally, to implement Asset, we need Type UUID and Asset Dynamic. An Asset Dynamic is implemented for anything with Type UUID. So effectively, Asset only requires a UUID. Let's go back to the code and create our material and start implementing things. First, let's create a strut my material, which will be our Material 2D, and we'll end up passing this to our Material Mesh bundle. We want to implement Material 2D and Render Asset for it, and we'll let VS Code fill in placeholders for the four functions. Let's cover Asset first because it's the easiest. Unfortunately, following Bevy's docs for UUID doesn't really tell us what we need to do. But if we look up the type UUID crate, we'll see a simple derive example, and they link to a recommended website to generate the magic number. If we follow these instructions, then we have successfully implemented asset, and one out of three of our tasks are done. Next, let's look at implementing render asset. The first function we see is extract asset, and the description tells us that we need to transfer the material from the app world to the render world. Without going down a rabbit hole, the basic idea here is that there are two separate ECS worlds in our project. One we have been using this whole time, which has all of our resources, entities, and systems, and a separate render world that has its own set of resources, entities, and systems specific to rendering. Extract is the point where data can move from the main game world into the render world, and basically everything we'll be doing for the rest of this video takes place in the render world. Thankfully, the docs tell us that the extracted asset may be the same type as the render asset. Our asset has no data, and there's nothing to extract, so let's do that and make the extracted asset associated type just my material. Now, to implement extract asset, we'll just return a clone of our strut. Next, let's look at prepare asset. The docs here say we need to turn our extracted asset into a GPU representation. Let's create a strut called my material GPU, and that will be our prepared asset type. Also here, we get the param type as a system param item. The docs here tell us that this type should be all the ECS data we need to create the prepared asset. System params are anything that we could use as parameters to our system functions, and we will make this a tuple of them. This lets us get resources and even query entities from the render world. 
For now, let's just set it as an empty type because we don't need anything to create the MyMaterialGPU strut yet. Let's return the empty GPU strut. Now we've implemented render asset and we can go back to implementing Material2D. First, we need to implement bind group. This function receives the prepared asset we created in the render asset implementation and needs to return a bind group. The docs say a bind group is used to set up uniforms, which are basically any data that every vertex or fragment will have access to, like a texture. We will look at using these in the next video, but for now we don't need any. I'd recommend reading through the Learn WGPU tutorial if you want to learn more about bind groups now. The docs also tell us that we can create bind groups using render device create bind group. Unfortunately, we're only given our prepared asset strut here, so we can't call create bind group. I believe this is intentional because this function is called every frame, while all the other functions are only called once. And creating the bind group every frame isn't what we want. So instead, we need to already have the bind group in the prepared asset strut. And we'll just return a reference to it here. So now we need to go back and start adding code to prepare asset to create the bind group there. To create the bind group, we need a render device. Thankfully, the render world already has one as a resource we can access using the param type we looked at earlier. If we just use res for the param type, we'll get a ton of lifetime errors. Thankfully, the docs tell us that we can use the lifetimeless variants of system params to get around this. These are the same params but marked with a capital S and use a static lifetime. Adding the render device resource to the param, and then getting it in our function lets us call create bind group. Now all this needs is a bind group descriptor, which is just an optional label, a layout, and a list of entries. We can set the label to none for now, and let's look at getting the layout. Unfortunately, it looks like the docs are broken here. After looking at the example code, we find that they get the layout from a Material2D pipeline resource. When we look at the source code for this, we see it calls the bind group layout function on Material2D that we haven't implemented yet. And this resource is added by the Material2D plugin of our custom type. So let's go add that plugin to the app builder, and now we can add the Material2D pipeline as a static resource to our params, and then we can get it in the prepare asset function. Honestly, from a Material2D perspective, I think we should just be given the render device and pipeline, because I see no other way to create bind groups without these two, and this seems to be the only place to create the bind group. I'd love to hear if anyone knows the technical reason why these need to be in param here, instead of giving them to us like is done in the bind group layout in Material2D. This would also help with knowing that we need the Material2D plugin, as that is a bit magical as well. This is all in the example code though, so maybe I'm just coming at it from the wrong angle here. Let's add the layout reference to the descriptor, and now all we need is a list of entries. We aren't using any uniforms in this video, so we'll just leave this as an empty list and we'll populate it next time. Now we have one last function to fill out, which is bind group layout. This uses a render device to produce a bind group layout. Interestingly, we just saw that this layout is immediately given back to us in the Material2D pipeline, and is used to create the bind group. So we have this weird flow of data back and forth with the engine, where we create a layout, the engine gives that to a resource, and then we ask for the same data back to create a custom strut, which we are then given again, and need to return the bind group from. The data flow here is a little complex to follow, but after enough time it should click. I expect this API will get much cleaner and easier to use as Bevy ages. Alright, let's create the bind group layout. We just need a descriptor, which is an optional label, and a list of entries. Again, we'll set the label to none, and then the entries to another empty list. It's important to note that this list must match exactly the list that we gave in the bind group descriptor. Any change to one must be reflected in the other, and we'll cover this next time. Now we have properly implemented Material2D in the most basic way possible. We can go back to our spawn quad system and add a param for the resource of assets of our material type. Then, for the material on our bundle, we'll add the handle to our material. If our material had data, then this would make more sense, because every instance of it would have its own handle. Now when we run the game, we'll see a magenta square, which is our mesh running our material. Specifically, it's running a default shader, which is provided by Bevy. Here we see what color is being drawn in the fragment shader. This shader contains both a vertex and a fragment shader default, which we are using because we provide neither. Let's get our own fragment shader running by creating a mymaterial.wgsl in our assets folder. I'm not going to go into too much detail about WGSL right now, but Bevy also supports GLSL if you're more comfortable with that. Here let's just create a fragment shader, and it needs to have an entry point named fragment. You can find this by looking at the default pipeline descriptor in mesh2d mesh.rs. 
Also here you can see the default vertex attributes you have access to. Here we can return a vect4 to location 0, which is the color target of our quad. As an input to our shader, we can grab the vertex output strut that the default shader will produce. Now we have the coordinates of the fragment in screen space, world space, and a UV value. With this we can create any number of effects. For this example, I'll show the UV as the red and green channel of the image. Now to actually run our shader code, we can implement the fragment shader function on Material 2D. And we can use the asset server to load our shader and return its handle. If we want to be really fancy here, we can even enable hot asset reloading, and now we can change our shader code as the game is running. If you want to learn more about WGSL, I would once again recommend the Learn WGPU tutorial. One note is that if you find yourself in the WGSL spec manual, it seems that the version Bevy is running is from around January 18th of 2022. After that, there is a significant syntax change, so be aware of that. I've linked the version of the spec that I use in the description. At this point, you have a nice playground to play around with some simple shaders. The things you can do with shaders are beyond my scope, but there are plenty of other resources you can use now that you have your own custom shaders and bevy. This was a long concept heavy video, but I hope the approach of stepping slowly through the docs in a natural order was a good way to learn the topic. I'd recommend following this up with the shader material example, and that is what we'll be building in the next video. This video took a lot of effort and research to make, so please remember to like and subscribe, and any feedback is much appreciated. If you have any corrections, please leave them in the comments and I'll pin them. Also, all the code used here is linked in the description. Thank you for watching.